Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Simon Phipps joins me. We're going to go old school, all the way back to the early days of BBSing and talk about Citadel, or at least the modern equivalent of the Citadel BBS. You don't want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Floss Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Simon Phipps. Episode 209, recorded May 2nd, 2012. Citadel. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free Libre open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at Stonehenge.com, bringing you each week, or as often as I can manage to do it, the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the small projects, the projects you may have heard a lot about, even sometimes projects you haven't heard anything about, like maybe today's project. We'll see as we get into it. But I'm usually almost always joined by a wonderful co-host, no exception this week, Simon Phipps. Welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Randall. It's great to be back, uh, beaming in from Southampton in the United Kingdom. You're looking awfully tanned and uh, and healthy after all those cruises, I have to say. And that's a, a fine beard that you're developing there as well. Indeed, indeed. And I just looked it up on Wikipedia. Apparently, this is called a Van Dyke, where you have just the uh, the stuff on the top and the stuff on the bottom. I shaved off the sides because the sides weren't growing in very much. And so... Uh, You know, I'm liking it. I'm probably going to keep it for at least a little while longer. For those of you that haven't been listening to the shows recently, I started growing a beard at age 50, the day I turned 50. And uh, so I have not been clean shaven since that day. And uh, that's about four months ago, five months ago. So Yeah, yeah. you can catch the daily photographs of Randall's beard on, uh, if you go look on uh, all the places where he posts. It's it's like watching time-lapse photography being developed. If you saw that, that cool video of the kid growing up, you can watch Randall's beard turning gray as well. My beard growing up, yes, exactly. Well, it starts gray. It doesn't really, it, but it gets longer <laughs> a little bit now. But it's kind of stabilized a little bit. But you can see every different Scotty Vest T-shirt that I'm wearing. So that's sort of fun to see the different shirts every day, but they're all Scotty Vest because I, I like the shirts. And I'm not getting paid to say that at all. Anyway, um, so uh, today's guest, we got to set the Wayback Machine for today's guest. Today's guest is Art Cancro, and you probably don't know him because he's working heavily behind the scenes. But his work dates all the way back. Do you remember the old BBSs back? in the day simon i i do vaguely remember that in actual fact that was how i first got online i did my first web page in 1992 for ibm and i got all of the skills that i used for that from working on bbs's from about 1986 onwards silent 700s and and uh uh, 1200 ball modems oh the memories are flooding back (laughs) <laughs> and that's dating both of us since we both are familiar with what this is all about, <laughs> speaking of being 50, right? But uh, there was a very famous BBS in the day, and I remember actually a few instances of this, but called the Citadel BBS. And it was a great place where people could log in, or really log in, like fight over the two or three modem lines that were set up, and then come in and, and send email back and forth, or the, or the equivalent of email back in the day, and leave messages and, and, and basically open forum posts or whatever, what we call forums today. Well, Citadel evolved in the sense that uh, Art Cancro and a few of his friends have taken what originally was this modem-based software and wrote it so it would work on first Telnet online and then later to have sort of a web interface. You could actually have it much more like the modern systems as the Internet sort of deployed out through there. So we're going to bring him on to talk about that. I actually, I got to read this because his bio is kind of kind of funny here. So it says, I'm an old school Unix hack. I've been tinkering with these systems since I was about 14 years old. I began a Unix implementation of Citadel in 1987. The original version was built on CPM in 1981. This, this is how old this particular project is, has history back to. And remain the today's uh, lead developer today. I am employed at Zand, a mid-sized hosting provider in the Northeast, where we make extensive use of open source software. And for the last, get this, 24 years, I've operated a Citadel site at uncensored.citadel.org where you can chew the fat with some of the hippest cats this side of the web. So it, 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 it seems to me from exchanging email with him, he's going to be a pretty cool guy. So we'll, uh, we'll see how that all works out. But before we... Uh, 
Oh, any any comments on the project before we uh, before we? Uh, uh, go I'm off? just uh, noting that this uh, the Citadel ran on uh, was written for CPM and ran on a Heathkit Heathkit H89. Um, this is uh, this is. Uh, <laughs> I'm suddenly feeling very, very old. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I think that all, all we're going to do is reminisce in the show. I can pretty much decide that right at the beginning. So it'll be pretty fun. But before we bring on our wonderful guest and talk about this project, I have a short but brief and important announcement to announce to you. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you save time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways to instantly access your streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. You can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac or PC or iPad. I have a Mac. I have it running in my uh, my room. I was watching Netflix last, last night right there in my hotel room. You can watch on your iPhone and some Android phones, too. I have it streaming on my iPhone as well. If you have a gaming console, an Xbox 360, a PS3, or a Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV. One of the few times I'm back in Portland, my PS3 is playing Netflix almost constantly. And if you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV box or a Roku box. They're inexpensive and easy to use. I also have a Roku and it works fine there as well. With Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of these devices. And you can begin watching a movie or show on one device and then finish on a different one. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and TV shows as you want anytime you want. And you can cancel anytime. Try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twit. That's netflix.com slash T-W-I-T. Be sure to use this URL when you sign up for your free trial, netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of Twit, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And now, on with the show. So let's go ahead and bring on our guest, Art Kankro. Welcome to the show. Good morning, Randall. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, well, thanks for joining us on the show. And where are you speaking to us from? Uh, I am in uh, Newcastle, a uh, suburb of New York City, uh, about 20 miles north of the city. And uh, I'm at home today, but... Uh, oh. You know? Over on the East Coast then. Okay, so you're about three time zones away yes. from me. Sort of, actually, you're about situated midway between me and Simon. You're kind of like halfway divvying the, the point up. That's pretty nice there. So be, that was that's be. the usual time zone conversation that I have and location that covers you have. At the beginning of the show, I sort of took a stab at what I think Citadel is about. But uh, why don't you guys give us the 30,000-foot view of what Citadel is about? Sure. Um, Citadel may be one of the oldest uh, open source applications you'll ever come across. It has actually been around in multiple forms, one form or another, since 1981 when the original uh, version came out. Back then it was exclusively a BBS platform. But it's evolved over the years. Uh, people have used it for all sorts of different uh, uh, groupware, messaging, collaboration type applications. Today, Citadel is uh, one of the um, premier open source groupware applications. It does the things that you might expect from something in that space, email, uh, calendars, address books, and some other unconventional things such as blogs, wikis, instant messaging, uh, various types of note keeping. And uh, we've remained true to our open source roots through the entire project. Everything that we do is 100% GPL, which I think is kind of unique because um, there's a lot of uh, applications in that space that are open core only, but we stick to open source. We're 100% GPL. Well, that was an answer full of all sorts of information. Thanks for being on the show. I'll see you again next week. No, no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's 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 take that apart a little bit because I think you used some terms that maybe some of our younger audience members aren't even familiar with. Can you, uh, you and I are obviously old enough to go back to this stuff, but can you describe what a BBS was? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, something that uh, that I've been interested in since I was uh, preteen actually it's uh, you know BBS bulletin board system back in the 1970s before people had you know cheap inexpensive and ubiquitous internet access uh, BBSs were what you used if you wanted to go online and, and collaborate with people talk with people uh, people would dial up with modems into these systems which were basically one of three classes um, some of them, like mine, were hobbyist systems, just run just for the sheer love of the craft. Some of them were paid systems, 
uh, where you'd pay a monthly fee, typically a pretty small one, and they'd be like the super hobbyists or the people who wanted to turn it into a small business. And some were operated by companies for their own purposes. But you'd log on, you'd send email, you'd exchange messages with people, you'd basically chew the fat on whatever topic was was relevant for the day. And although the dial-up world has gone away largely, um, PBSs are still alive and well. Nobody calls them that anymore. Now they call them either forums or, if I may be so bold, social networks, which in my opinion are just an outgrowth of the BBS uh, scene from, from decades past. And one of the characteristics of these machines, because I was also pretty heavily involved in the BBS scene in the Portland metro area back when back in the day. In fact, my brother ran the Atari BBS for many uh, months and years. Um, <laughs> So uh, uh, one of the characteristics of these things is they had a limited number of phone lines that you could dial in, sometimes just one. Sometimes and so you just had one. Kind of, it, you had to keep waiting for somebody else to get off the line so that you could then log in. Sure, and, 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 and people would that. speed yeah. dial. They'd have their modems dial over and over automatically um, and, until you got through, and it was a big deal to finally get through to your favorite system. And I remember multi-line BBS is actually being kind of a new wave for a while. We're kind of like, oh, my God, he has three lines? Are you kidding me? We'll always sure. be able to get into this one. <laughs> and, and what amused me was the hoops that the, uh, the, uh, the DOS people had to jump through to actually make multiple lines work. They typically had to have multiple computers, one running each line. And that's why the lines would be called nodes. And as a, you know, old school Unix hack, uh, that was just foreign to me. It's like, you know, this system is inherently multi-user. Why would you want to do anything like that? And uh, Unix BBSing never really caught on uh, outside of a very small sphere of influence. But uh, as things migrated to the internet, um, it, it started to catch on more. And now Linux is prevalent in that type of situation. Um, I've been running a BBS ever since uh, I was a teenager. It started in 1988. And mm -hmm. uh, I still run it today, and of course it runs on Citadel, even though Citadel has evolved to be something far, far more than that. And I do want to stress that you know some people see that our, see our history and they think Citadel is nothing more than an open grow an overgrown BBS, but it does so many more things than that now. Yeah, I actually wanted to talk a little bit about that. So Citadel existed as a BBS system before the web existed, where you use sure. phone lines and have to call in. And maybe later on, when as the internet slowly deployed, maybe Telnet in, as, as I see in a couple of the examples I was exactly. able to Google for. Uh, but your software, the, some people call it Citadel slash UX or something, is, mm -hmm. is inherits the the like the philosophy of the original system, but really isn't a continuation of the code base, right? What it inherits is the philosophy of mm -hmm. the original 1981 implementation. It is all new code, and when I say new, I mean 1987. But <laughs> that's, that's, that's you know that's the the origin of of our implementation of it. But yes, it inherits the philosophy, and if you're using it in text mode, um, which is the way the old school BBS people would use it, it inherits the same user interface. Uh, I've been a Citadel user since 1982 or so, but um, my implementation of it, or what's now our implementation of it, began in 1980. Uh, and it was originally we wanted to have this culture, this online culture, uh, present and hosted by the Unix world. And you know, it was open source before most of us even really understood what that was going to be about on a large scale. And uh, in, in I think it was 1998 or so that a number of us were working in various portions of the IT business – uh, hosting email systems, watching the failures of far more expensive sites and servers. And, and at one point, we just had this eureka moment where we realized that groupware is really just a, how did one person put it, a BBS system that's optimized for business poindexters. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and we kind of had this eureka moment and realized we had a platform and with some tweaking and some more features and certain, uh, you know, stabilization and, 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 and uh, a good solid base underneath it that we had already started to build, that we could do a lot of the things that companies like Lotus and Novell and Microsoft were doing. And we could do it open source. And we could probably do it and make it a lot easier for people to do than those people could do it at the time. One of the things that we noticed was that there was a disparity between um, the non-open source and the open source offerings, even for something as simple as email. You could take one of the big proprietary systems, and if you were okay with computers in, mm -hmm. in, in any reasonable capacity, you could drop a CD into the drive 
and run an install program, give it a domain name, and chances are if you were decent with computers, you'd have a working system. Mm-hmm. And you know, you go back as far as I do, so you probably also know how hard it was to even to get a simple mail system running on open source <laughs> back oh, yeah. in those days. You had a lot of editing of configuration files. Chances are you were you were um, compiling things from scratch and we didn't want those to be the only two choices. So we set out to have something that was as easy to install as the big proprietary systems, uh, but that was 100% open source and, and ran on Linux and Unix systems. So let's also just want to distinguish, though, you, there was a phase there where Citadel, the thing you were writing, you and your friends were writing, uh, to, to emulate or at least inherit the philosophy of the original one, was really mostly just a telnet only uh, online software then, and then eventually added the web interfaces and the other uh, sort of SMTP and other interfaces? Sure. Initially, you know, initially back in the original days when it was just a BBS program, um, that's what you did. You telnetted to it. And uh, in the early 90s, we started migrating it to a client server platform just so we could have multiple user interfaces. And at the time, we envisioned that there would be a number of different you know, fat clients that were available that would be made available for it because that's what everybody did in the groupware space at the time or even in the client server, you know, if you think about things like AOL and CompuServe, you downloaded a client. We hadn't been thinking about groupware until maybe 1998 or so, but we still had this idea of a communications platform that would be mm-hmm. used for large online sites. So we wanted to do clients. The The fat clients never really materialized, but uh, it gave us it gave us that platform that we were then able to use to parlay that into uh, a world class groupware platform. So after we went client server, it, it was not just Telnet anymore. Although for the first, I would say for the first ten twelve years of the of the platforms, the program's existence, if you wanted to connect to it, you had to Telnet, and that was normal at the time. Wow. Yeah, that sounds uh, like. Uh... I, 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 of course, you know, immediately my, my brain right now goes, tell that, no, 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 SSH now, SSH. Does it still do a, and that's uh, SSH? that's what a lot of people do today. Okay, so you don't have to up. use Telnet. <laughs> okay, good. You don't have to, no. <laughs> if, if, if you're talking about a Citadel system that's being used in the, you know, the large online community or even small online community capacity as opposed to a internal, you know, communication server for an organization, um, you can Telnet to it. But I find that most people SSH to it. Um, or you can run the client, the text mode client on your old on your own machine, which is what a lot of the more heavy users do. Um, in, it's available from our site. It's in the Debian repos. It's in the Ubuntu repos. You can just apt get install Citadel client, and uh, then you can point that at your favorite Citadel server. And you know encryption and everything else are built into that, so you can you, you've got several choices. We've actually found that the text mode user interface, even though it was originally designed for BBS purposes, people are finding it useful even in the groupware uh, community. For example. Out in um, out in uh, Minnesota, there's a group that has put together a packet radio network for emergency services, and they intend to have this network available even if all of society is crumbling, and you know all of the traditional lines of communications are down. Their packet radio network will still work, and they chose Citadel. One of the reasons is because of the text mode interface because low bandwidth connections are very happy with that and people can just jump on and and not have to worry about establishing a wideband connection just to get to communications with other people in the organization. Right. So I'm very interested by all this because uh, back in the, my dark past, I used to work on uh, all sorts of groupware systems. I used to install email for people back in uh, 1986. Uh, so exactly what's behind all this stuff? I'm just looking at the screenshots here now, and you've got everything in there. You've got calendaring, you've got uh, emails, you've got uh, task lists. It's all in there. What, what's behind all this software? Is it connecting to standard servers or do you have homebrew no, uh, servers behind it all? And this is the difference between Citadel and a lot of the other open source applications that operate in this space. If you take uh, a handful of, of uh, most of the others, and I'm not going to name them at this point, you probably know what they all are by now, um, what they usually do is they'll take an entire copy of Postfix and an entire copy of MySQL and an entire copy of Dovecot or Cyrus IMAP, and they'll just take all of these things, they'll lash them together, uh, they'll put in a unified configuration framework, 
network and then they'll um, you know put a, put their nice web interface sitting on top of it and they'll call that their product now what you get with that is a very heavy footprint because you've got all these programs that you've brought in and you're maybe only using 10% of the functionality of each one we intended to build Citadel a little bit differently. Part of that is because of the platform that we already had in existence from the BBS days of old. But part of that is because of our design philosophy. Everything is custom built. Uh, let me use the email engine as an example. Citadel speaks SMTP, of course. You have to if you want to speak uh, to Internet mail. So instead of bringing in an entire copy of Postfix where you're using 10% of the functionality, we wrote all of our custom C code. Now, the SMTP agent in Citadel is responsible for doing nothing other than bringing email in and out of that Citadel site from the Internet. And because we managed to do things like that, it, it only ends up being 1,000, 2,000 lines of code. Very light footprint because it's purpose-built for what it's doing. Has it taken us a lot longer to build what other people have built by bringing in existing programs and just strapping them in? Absolutely, but we have a much tighter integration, a much smaller footprint, and uh, uh, people people notice that. So, so does that mean that if I have, for example, uh, Google Calendar calendars, can I access those from within Citadel, or do, is there a specific Citadel calendar that I would need to use? Citadel is a fully integrated stack. It is intended to be used by itself. Now, there's lots of import and export functions. Uh, for example, we have RSS capabilities in every part of the system can be sourced or sunk uh, in a Citadel uh, room. And the room is the basic unit of, of containerization. And using that, you can speak to other calendars, you can sync with other calendars, but our user interface is designed for nothing other than using the system itself. It's a, it's a fully right. integrated stack. So now, uh, just to, to drill a little further into that, so are you saying that you are you supporting things like WebDAV and uh, IMAP to integrate with external systems? So you're you're yes. using standards for all that? Yes, absolutely. If there's a standard protocol available for something, we do our best to speak it. Uh, WebDAV is a protocol that we use, for example, for connecting uh, connecting calendar clients. And, and, and things like that. If I have my Android phone and I want to read my, my Citadel uh, uh, calendar, DAV is the protocol that you'd use uh, to do that. And IMAP, of course, for the email, uh, you can connect various different, uh, like Thunderbird and uh, what is the, the lightning extension for calendaring. We use standard protocols where we can because we know that people want to connect standard clients to it. We don't restrict you to our web user interface. Right, but but that's that's in terms of people who are going to be clients of your server software. Uh, mm -hmm. I, if am I able to uh, display my uh, my Caldav calendar uh, in Citadel if I'm a user on Citadel, or would I have to import it one time and then maintain it in Citadel from then on? What you would do, yeah, you, you, we don't uh, act as a client client towards things like WebDAV. Um, there's plenty of import, there's plenty of export, and again, you can use things like RSS to sync them in both directions. But we don't do a lot of things where you're using the Citadel system as a client to external data sources. Um, you can use it as a feed reader, um, to, to, for example, to pull calendar data, web news, whatever it is. You can pull in uh, POP3 email from external sources. So you can use it as an aggregator, but you wouldn't use it as more of like a real-time client. Right, right. So this wouldn't really be a, a suitable enterprise client for a load of uh, enterprise middleware tasks. This is, this is really much more for the BBS-style environment uh, dragged kicking and screaming into the 20, uh, 21st century. In the enterprise organizations, they tend to have their own infrastructure, and Citadel is probably really not for that. Uh, on the other hand, we're more than just you know an overgrown BBS, as I said before. Our core demographic these days seems to be small to mid-sized organizations that really want a self-contained, low-maintenance, fully integrated stack. So what would an example, uh, I, I can kind of imagine some of the organizations for which this would be apropos, but can you give me some of the um, actual sort of user base, what it sort of looks like? We tend to be popular with small businesses. Uh, nonprofits love us because uh, they have a low budget. Um, we have some universities that are using the system. Uh, basically anything where it's that, that sub-1,000 user um, 
uh, demographic. The large enterprises, they tend to have the way they do things and it's set in stone. So we don't really go after that space. And uh, rightly so, because I think the big guys like Microsoft and Lotus have sort of abandoned um, the smaller space. They're they're gunning for the enterprise so hard that I think they've left a lot of the smaller guys behind. So we're happy to serve that space. So rather than me having to, if I was a small organization and I didn't have any local expertise uh, where I would have to bring in an expert for a while to set up an Ubuntu system sitting in the corner that uh, sure. that would have uh, like, uh, you know, have to figure out how to install PostFix and figure out how to install that. And then whenever anything broke because, you know, they didn't all talk to each other or some setting wasn't made in, in the right way, uh, Citadel provides me ability as a small organization to say, I just want, I just want somewhere to, you know, Send files back and forth, and, and chat, and and send mail out to the real world and back, and have it end up in a reasonable place. It's sort of like this. It's a one-stop shopping sort of a. Sort of like the difference between say um, someone who goes out and buys a component stereo system. It's probably dating myself too. A component audio <laughs> home entertainment system, sort of that way. God, stereo. We're talking about BBSs. So that's why I'm thinking back to the day. Yeah. So rather than have you got a cassette life, drive there? <laughs> yeah, right. let, me, let me put my eight yeah, track on the top up to his row. Pet computer. <laughs> I put my a turntable and my eight track on the top floor. Okay. Uh, so rather than this, this would so, most people who are high end uh, home entertainment have like pieces of everything. Everything just sort of glues together, and you spend hours putting all the wires in the back, but. There are some people that still just want like a, a you know, a, I'm going to date myself again back. I was about to say ghetto blaster. But like a, like a, sure. They a, just a want to bring it home and there. make it work. Right. They're so not, inter- they're not interested in the underpinnings. They're not interested in becoming experts. They just want to have something work. And we're actually pretty proud of where we are with regard to that. Um, I've, you know, like a lot of people, thankfully, I'm not in this space anymore uh, at this point in my career. But like a lot of us, I did a lot of um, uh, field service work. And some of that was installing and maintaining email systems. And open source was criticized at one point for difficult installation for things like this. So Mm -hmm. at one point, we made it part of our core mission to make everything easy to install. In fact, we have uh, a build script uh, that's called Easy Install, and you can just pipe that right off of our website into your shell, and it'll compile and build and install the whole system for you. uh, We also removed... Anything that involved editing configuration files, the installer asks you a very minimum number of questions and then tells you where to go in the web interface to finish your configuration. It's, it's out of the box and onto your system. The, the joke we used to make is that uh, it's so easy even an MCSE could do it. Uh, <laughs> I'm going for that market, I can tell. Hey, uh, so I also saw, if, if I recall correctly, that you also even have like a, like it's either a VMware appliance or, a, or, or maybe a uh, VirtualBox appliance? Uh, both, actually. We have an um, uh, open, open source virtualization version and we have uh, one that's built for VMware. And it's the very same software. Uh, all we've done there is is taken a minimal uh, Linux operating system install. We've run our easy install script on it, optimized it, tuned it up a little bit, and put it out there for people to download. That way, when it's time for them to upgrade, they can do it the same way everybody else does. So this uh, system that you've got here, if I wanted to install this on one of the machines in my um, my garden shed, uh, which is my server room, if you were concerned... Uh, is this just like installing the, the best approach to installing Asterisk where the smart people don't install Asterisk, people install a Linux distro where someone's worked out already how to configure Asterisk? Is that the same way you'd go about installing Citadel as well? Would you go get a complete distro with Citadel ready configured and just smack it on the machine? Or is, is this something you go in with a knife and fork and set up? We we have people that do this at every level, and if you want to download all of the tarballs and do the installation yourself, you can certainly do that. We list all the prerequisites. Um, we have Debian and Ubuntu packages, which um, maybe at times fall a little bit behind the cutting edge, but they're updated. Uh, and, uh, of, of course, we have the easy install script. And, again, that is an install script that you pipe right out of the web and into your shell, and it takes care of everything for you. We have gone through countless cycles of here's a point where people tend to get hung up, and we smooth that out, and we get an entire stratum of of, of usability that we then take care of. And then there's another, we always find there's another stratum below that of people that are even less skilled that are trying to set up the system. So I like to think that we're, we're getting easier and easier to install because the people that are having trouble 
installing it are moving to lower and lower skill levels. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where a a non-computer user would be able to install it. Uh, they just don't understand the concepts. But uh, it's it's one of our core principles that we don't want any any stupid problems to come up. We we want it to be as smooth as possible, and we do focus on that. So since you've implemented Mail from scratch and uh, uh, you know, IMAP from scratch and maybe NNTP and IRC, I don't know how many other things are listed there. But We do, uh, we do uh, XMPP, we, uh, instant messaging yeah, clients. Okay. Now, so there's a couple of concerns I have about that. One is uh, feature compatibility. Since you're starting with a completely independent code base, um, what assurances do uh, do you have, or do you have an extensive test suite that can make sure that you're interoperable with the, the standard interfaces? Well, obviously, there's uh, there's a lot of things that we need to interoperate with just to stay running. Um, uh, my workplace, which is a a hosting center where I oversee mm-hmm. a lot of different operations, so we use it internally. So mm-hmm. uh, anything that anything that comes up in terms of interoperability, I tend to I tend to find out pretty early. If there's one thing you don't want to mess up, it's your boss's mailbox. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. but we also I found that our our community is fabulous at at ironing out interop problems pretty early in the pretty early in the game. And then the second concern I would have is I'm I'm not sure since you since again it's an independent code base for implementing something like mail, uh, you're not able to necessarily leverage from the things that people have figured out about security around all these services. And I'm wondering if I search the cert database for the word Citadel, if a lot of things would pop up. A few things will pop up. We've we've had vulnerabilities come up from time to time, and we address them pretty quickly. I think uh, one of the things that we have actually uh, as an advantage to the way that we develop is because all of our code is custom built, there aren't a lot of edge cases, and the attack footprint is much smaller than it is uh, than it would be if you took half a dozen third party programs and lashed them together. Yeah, you know, I, I understand that in the sense that uh, there, are, there are far fewer attacks on FreeBSD than there are on Linux, but that's mostly because of market size. And Exactly, uh, and there's definitely fewer Citadel sites out there than others. Okay, okay, but it's, it's, it's nothing, and the question's actually coming up from the chat room is, would this be something that would be safe to throw in, uh, say, uh, an Amazon uh, EC2 instance and know that you're probably not going to get hacked too badly? I can't speak for EC2 in terms of how safe or secure that environment is, but it's going to be no more or less secure uh, in the cloud than it would be on your own on a private cloud or on your own hardware. Um, again, the attack surface is very small because everything is purpose built. We have a design in place where we don't expose anything to the outside world unless it is locked down. All of the protocols uh, expose uh, SSL, TLS, and uh, there's no security built into the client. All the security is built into the server. So, but you know, back in the day, there were things like hacked AOL clients and whatnot that could expose functionality that you weren't really supposed to have. And, you know, we learn from watching things like that. We, we really make an effort to have all of the security built into the lowest layers of the system. Now let's talk about a little bit about scalability now. So what sort of iron do I need to support? Uh, I guess you're always going to say it depends, but uh, what, what, what's been the typical box that's needed in terms of disk and CPU and stuff for, for say, a small to medium organization? As you might expect, the size of the um, hardware is going to depend largely upon how many users you have and how big their their data stores are but i would say for you know like for example if if you wanted to run a small site for you know uh, a half dozen to a dozen people you could get away with a with a tiny tiny you know 512 megabyte machine and i've seen people do that and uh, if you wanted to support you know a few dozen users or a hundred users you you would be able to get away with you know your, your typical server class machine now you know a gig of memory and and a nice fast disk one of the nice things about Citadel is that you can take pieces of it and split it off onto different machines. For example, if you wanted to run the web user interface on a different machine than the core server, you could do that. You could even do a load balanced farm of them if you wanted to. And then we also have a uh, a more horizontal way to scale it, which is that you can take multiple Citadel servers and you can put them into a federated network and hmm. they'll share domain names, they'll share user databases and, and, and move data back and forth between them and things like that. So uh, 
a, to take a different angle, and uh, I, normally on uh, these sorts of interviews, I look after community and licensing questions. So sure. I wonder if we can dig into the nature of your uh, your co development community. W- w- what does it look like? Uh, you know, uh, who is developing this code and why are they doing it? Most of us are doing it for the sheer love of the craft. I, I could I could say that you know it's advantageous to our careers, and it is. I could say that we wrap uh, services around it and make money that way, and we do. But uh, it's it's a community that is really doing it for the sheer love of the craft. It is a labor of love for most of us. Uh, I would say there's uh, at this point there's four or five people in the core developer community. If you look at the commit list, you'll probably find twenty or thirty people. And, uh, you know, spread around the world uh, doing different things. There's different people that are interested in different parts of the system. You know, some are more interested in user interface. Um, We've got a a guy in Germany who's just hell-bent on optimization. And, you know, that's good because it keeps us lean and mean. So who owns the code? Uh, does it, is it owned by each of the individual – is the copyright owned by each of the individual developers or do you aggregate the copyright? What's the story there? We do not require copyright assignment. In fact, we don't even accept copyright assignment. We are pretty uh, intent on making sure everybody owns the rights uh, to their own code just to you know, keep us honest. Somebody can look at this licensing and say, there's no one party that can take this proprietary at some point in the future if they decide that, uh, that they want to. Everything is licensed under the GPL, GPL version 3, and, uh, and we intend to keep it that way. So I'm interested you picked GPL version 3. Did you consider using AGPL, seeing as you're uh, very much an online service and AGPL is tuned to that? At the time, the AGPL wasn't on our radar. Um, if we were making that decision today, we, we, might, we might consider it. But at the time we were making that decision, um, it was not the kind of thing we were really thinking about. Right, right. So this would be why you don't have any kind of an open core approach because you, you don't have a single code owner. That's part of it. Uh, part of it is that we're purists, but the other part of it is that uh, we wouldn't be able to do that even if we wanted to. Right, right. And uh, do you have relationships with other communities? For for example, you know, it, it, it would look to me like you'd be a really good candidate to have a relationship with uh, a community like the StatusNet people or with um, the uh, folks who are doing federated uh, f- free software in Freedom Box. Do you, do you have relationships into the community like that? We explore things like that from time to time, and I really would be interested in doing more of that. Most of the uh, most of the uh, community building we've done in this space has actually been with other groupware projects. Uh, we have good relationships with uh, uh, the Colab people, for example. We've done some some uh, uh, some work in in cooperation with uh, Open Groupware and with um, the client side people, like on KDE. And uh, at one point, for example, there's a calendar library uh, called LibICal, which is the um, calendar library that's behind pretty much every non-Microsoft calendar software that's out there. And everybody uses it and everybody had their own fragment of it. So a couple of years ago, we decided, let's bring this back together. Because the code itself had been abandoned by the original developers. And we didn't like that. So we asked the original developers if we could take over maintainership of that library and we did and then one by one we got most of the major users of it to uh, help us fold in their their extensions their bug fixes and um, and then they dropped their forks we dropped our forks so I'm happy to say that pretty much everybody who uses that calendar library now is using the upstream version again because now there is a maintained upstream version right Right, and are you doing that with other libraries as well? Because uh, I, you know, I, I keep an eye on the LibreOffice community, and I've noticed them doing a lot of work on libraries to do with graphic formats that help the the wider free software movement as well as themselves. Uh, are you digging into other libraries you use and trying to uh, create commonality? The calendar library, I think, would be the best example of that. Um, there hasn't been uh, I'm really happy to say that uh, the the other libraries that we've used uh, we've been lucky that they've been very well maintained right right and uh, looking at the look and feel it looks like you've got quite a a modern look and feel there do you have that look and feel um, separate from the you know do you have a model view controller approach so that you can reskin for different environments or uh, if I install Citadel is it going to look like it looks on the screenshots 
By default, it's going to look exactly the way that uh, that you're seeing in the screenshots because that's our main user interface and we're pretty proud of it. However, the uh, user interface is themable and there are some third-party themes that you can put online. Um, the interesting thing about that web user interface is that it doesn't use a framework. Uh, it has its own HTTP server built straight into it. And that has to do a lot with that ease of uh, ease of installation thing that I talked about before. When we first built uh, the web interface, which was 1996 or so, um, the way you typically did things like that was with CGI. And we found that a lot of our users were having trouble uh, uh, doing all of the right incantations to get the program integrated with Apache and there was permissions and there was all sorts of things. So we said, let's make it easier. Let's give this thing its own integrated HTTP server and those problems just went away. Right. That's so internationalization. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm quite interested in, in your community. Is your community all US based or do you have a, an international community and are you facilitating them through internationalization? The community, I would say, actually has more people international now than it does in the uh, in the United States. Uh, my my right hand man is that uh, that guy in Germany. Uh, his name is Wilfred, and he's uh, he's great at optimization. But he's the one that uh, originally uh, started the effort to say we've got to make this program available in in multiple languages. And you know, we banged out the German version in you know over the course of a couple of weeks, getting everything tweaked to to speak multiple languages and then we found that once we made that available the translators just started rolling in and we're we're fully translated in about a dozen language and we're partially translated in you know maybe 10 or 20 more so I, as as a programmer i'm sort of thinking this thing's going to be uh, kind of a nightmare inside but tell me tell me about the architecture of this thing cuz it's just been organic being grown for many years what's it what's it look like inside what what's it first what's it, what's it written in and how's it organized well it's all written in c and uh, <laughs> okay. again we're all old school and we're pretty good about that um, the message engine itself uses berkeley db mm -hmm. which uh, is still available under open source terms Thankfully, but even though Oracle owns them now, but we've actually changed our underlying store. Um, I'm thinking at least twice since we originally uh, since we originally started the project. We have a loosely coupled layer underneath. I wouldn't say it's pluggable, but uh, it's loosely coupled enough that it could be changed without gutting the entire program. Uh, on top of that, we have a core layer that handles all of the uh, security, all of the flow of data throughout the system. And then there's uh, modules that sit on top of that. There's one for calendaring, there's one for address books, there's one for wiki, there's one for blog, there's one for... And, and things like that every time we add a new function to the system. It's a, it's a cleanly built module. We used to load them dynamically. We found that was more trouble than it's worth. And we just build them into the system now. But there is very defined layers of the system. And then the clients, the user interfaces, sit on top of that, either on the same machine or on a different machine. Yeah, so I was just curious about that, too. So you're not, obviously not running it monolithically in one processor and, and a number of multiple fork processes. You're running it with some sort of API between the different layers. Uh, what, how is that developed? What, what does that look like? It's multi-threaded. Uh, the server engine itself is multi-threaded. Uh, we have a worker thread model where uh, there's a pool of threads that pick up work that has to be done. And uh, um, we're actually moving right now. The version that's just about to come out, 8.10, is actually moving to a fully event-driven model on the server. Um, our optimization team has been reading a lot about the, the C10K problem, 10,000 simultaneous clients, and admiring programs like the Nginx web server that are just insanely event driven and can handle a lot of traffic with very few resources. So we're moving to that architecture as well. On the web server, uh, it has its own multi-threaded server engine, except of course all it needs to handle is uh, incoming HTTP requests. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, do you have a rough idea of the line count? I mean, are we talking 10,000 lines or 100,000 lines of C? I would say it's uh, it's probably about a quarter million lines at this point. It's been a while since I looked at it, but we you know we we do have Olo tracking us. Um, it, you'd see it's a, it's a pretty smooth growth path over the over the time that it, that we've been using revision control, uh, which is in past 12, 12, 13 years or so. At this point, it's about a quarter million lines. We we try to keep it tight. We try to keep it lean. 
and I'm, I'm guessing you're the head honcho that decides ultimately whether anything goes in or out. But what's your what's your ordinance uh, governance look like? It's well, at the end of the day, it's, uh, you know, I have uh, final say over everything, but I, I try not to be bossy. Okay, cool. Okay. So, so is there like a small core team of people that are working very closely with you and then the rest is all just patches submitted? Exactly. There's, there's two or three people that really do most of the heavy lifting. And then there's a stratum around that of people who are interested in tweaking the user interface, uh, submitting and fixing bugs, uh, minor functionality changes, things like that. Now, given that this is open source and GPL, uh, uh, obviously I can take this and just install it as is on, on my system from, from source. But has sure. there been anybody that has uh, adapted it, modified it, uh, cr created changes to it that uh, uh, because or essentially forked the, the, the code? You know, that used to happen more often back in the BBS days. Um, in fact, that's what BBS operators tended to do. They um, they take the code, they'd fork it, maybe they didn't have any contact with the original developers. There were dozens and dozens of, of versions of Citadel floating about in the 1980s, in the early 1990s. Um, you know, they'd run on different platforms, they'd have different feature sets. Um, when During the brief time in the early 90s when internet BBSing in text mode was popular, um, there was one site at the University of Iowa that was running a fork of the our Citadel system, which at any given time had thousands of users on. Um, most of those forks have died off. In fact, uh, usually it would be Citadel followed by some other nomenclature that would tell you which variant you were using. Um, mm -hmm. But over the years, most of them have fallen by the wayside. Our variant was called Citadel UX. It was the version that ran on Unix systems. But since most of the other ones have fallen by the wayside, at least in the open source mainstream, we usually just refer to it as Citadel nowadays. And uh, how would I find the, I mean, is, is there likely one in my organization I don't even know about it? Or is, this, or is there some sort of master registry list somewhere if I, so I can go, go see if there's any public ones like this? If you go to uh, citadel.org, you'll be pointed to uh, various resources. The most obvious place to start would probably be on the public site that's operated by us in the core Citadel community. It's a uh, it's an online forum called Uncensored, and it grew out of the BBS that I started when I was a teenager, and that's at uncensored.citadel.org. You'll find a good community there, and you can find other places to land. And I've noticed you also have a wiki there, too. So obviously wiki is one of the many services that Citadel provides. Absolutely. And sometimes people find ways to, to even use those group work type features in a public site. Um, sometimes we use it as a scratch pad. Sometimes we use it to just maintain uh, a gestalt of information that we have out there to share. But mostly it's just uh, people use the message forum uh, rooms just to chew the fat. Uh, just a little bit more also about the development process because now I'm curious about this. So you have, uh, is, your, is your code repository in a, in a public space? Absolutely. We have a public Git repository. Mm, um, okay. The core development team has, uh, has commit access to that. Everybody else has read access to it, but, uh, and uh, it makes it very easy for people to submit patches. And is your, uh, is your uh, problem tracking thing through GitHub as well? No, it's not on GitHub. It's, it's a private Git server that we operate ourselves. We've operated um, bug reporting systems over the years, formal ones. We ran, um, for example, we ran uh, Bugzilla for a while. And we found that the quality of bug reports that people were submitting were either either invalid or poorly researched or people would put in feature requests and they'd mark them as high priority. You lost me again, didn't you? No, oh, no, you're, you're fine. Okay. At, least I, at least I kept hearing you. I don't know. I, the, the, the video for us <laughs> for a moment, but the people in the audio will go, what the heck are they talking about? It went just fine. <laughs> uh, so yes. when we, you were using Bugzilla, we found that the the quality of bug reports was was fairly low. People would mark uh, uh, feature requests as high priority, for example, or the bugs would be poorly researched, mm. or they'd have build problems that they reported as code problems. Eventually, we got out of that habit. Um, we used Citadel task lists for a while, as our bug reporting system. Uh, nowadays, we're using a wiki. We're finding that the, the free form of, uh, of just loose prose is a more efficient way of, of tracking, uh, tracking our bugs. And it's working a lot better than a formal bug tracking system has ever worked for us. 
And uh, do you have uh, test coverage? Are you testing end to end or at least testing uh, unit testing level for this stuff? There are unit tests built into the system, and we run them from time to time. Uh, we have moved a lot of our utility code out into a library that's shared among all of the pieces of our platform, and that has its unit test. The calendar library has a unit test. And uh, we have a staging site that's uh, semi-public that we roll all of our code out to and perform a, a suite of tests out on that before we let anything out to the public. Very good. You know, we're just about running out of time, so I just wanted to make sure that we covered everything you wanted to make sure was covered. Is there anything you think we left out that we should talk about still? The, the core thing about Citadel that, that turns some people off is that it's organized differently from a lot of the other products in this space. People are expecting to have something that's a clone of Microsoft Exchange, and we've never really wanted that. We've wanted to, to, to build something that, that, that people love to use, something built around the needs of the end users. So we have this container, the, the fundamental container of data in Citadel is called a room. The idea is you're moving around a building from room to room, and each one has its own function, whether it's a calendar or a message board or a mailbox or a data source from the Internet, like an RSS feed that you're reading. Um, and that's a long, long part of our history. The original design uh, came from things like uh, Alan Kay and his research at Park, where people really wanted to have um, familiar metaphors for, for what they were doing. And uh, a lot of people look at Citadel and they say, this is unconventional. But when they try it, they find it really makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Very good point. Very good point. Well, uh, I really enjoyed chatting with you today. So I'm going to enjoy chatting with you today and really want to thank you for coming. Oh, wait. Oh, 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 oh. you know, I'm going to get email if I don't ask these things. <laughs> VI or Emacs? You know, where I work, uh, firing up Emacs is grounds for dismissal. It's <sighs> VI all the way. <sighs> Another one on the bad side. Okay. And your favorite scripting language? Um, yeah, you're asking a hardcore C coder. Uh, about scripting languages. Oh, just recently, I've started warming up to Python, but mm. uh, in in, in the not too in for 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 most of my scripting history, I've done everything in shell. Yeah, shell's good. Shell's a good scripting language. Shell's, shell's a better answer than Python. Oh, just kidding. Just kidding. Either one. Whatever gets the job done at the end of the day is fine. Yes. True. Well, again, Art, I want to thank you for coming on the show and uh, and and telling our audience about uh, about uh, Citadel. Thanks a lot. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Very good, very good. That was Art Cancro, who is the uh, chief guy in charge of Citadel and a old time, all the way back to the BBS days, uh, online guy. What do you do? What do you think, Simon? Oh, I remember my uh, BBS days back in the 1980s, actually, uh, trying to work out how to send emails by stringing together great long UUCP bank paths and trying to work out the optimum route for my emails. So uh, it's very interesting to see how the evolution has come on there. It's a little bit like um, looking at the uh, that cult TV series Red Dwarf and seeing how Cat has evolved into a, a slick, smooth uh, player. And it looks to me like Citadel has done the same thing. It's uh, evolved into a, a, an amazingly comprehensive groupware system that could be very interesting for a small organization that wants a, a one-stop shop to meet all of their organizational groupware needs. Uh, yeah. How does it work out for you? How does it work out for you then? Does it, does it look cool? It, it, it's it's sort of interesting. I mean, I I kind of like the idea of an all in one box because I know that times I've talked to small organizations that uh, you know couldn't afford to hire me on a on a long enough basis to really get their system all set up, but they really wanted some sort of solution. And typically these days, just tell them to go go to Google Docs and Google Apps and things like that because it seems to be the the easy way to do this to offsite it. But if you wanted to have total control and local control, it seems like something like Citadel would be a great all in one solution. Uh, again, I, especially the concerns I raised during the main part of the interview, which is that uh, if you're if you're implementing this from scratch, uh, your interoperability issues are there. Your uh, uh, currency in terms of um, you know all the latest features are going to be a, a bit lagged because it's just whatever you know these guys and their patches can do. And then I'm still concerned about security because it's like you know I I, I trust these guys are, have written a lot of code, but there's still things that unless you have your own, if you, unless you really are twisted like I am sometimes really thinking about security that, that you, you wouldn't necessarily come across things that might work. Uh, but going back to BBS days, just to hit that subject again, I mean, I was back, you know, 110 baud acoustic coupled modems. Uh, I had a Sol 20 um, uh, machine that had a 300 baud modem eventually, and it actually had a lower case. So I was really amazed. I was finally getting to see stuff in lower case. But again, my brother did run uh, the Atari BBS for quite a uh, quite a number of months, maybe even years, I think. 
And I remember being on the actual console, which of course was an Atari, um, and and chatting with people that would that would that would dial in, you know, and here, here I am, you know, sitting at, at the actual console of the thing, chatting back and forth with whatever somebody was typing in. Uh, and I remember Z modem coming along and being so much better than X modem and Y modem, and then discovering right. that it was uh, Ward Cunningham nearby that uh, you know that actually wrote that. So I thought it was was that Ward? Yeah, it was Ward Cunningham, right? That did the Z modem stuff, and he uh, he went on eventually to do the stuff with uh, uh, the first wiki and. And uh, all this, uh, you know, test-driven development stuff. So pretty, pretty amazing stuff. Well, of course, that wiki stuff was another evolutionary consequence of uh, the bulletin board mov- movement in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I, I remember on BBSs, uh, the you know, BBS code gradually evolving. So I think we've got a lot of uh, uh, things that happen in the world today that we have to thank these guys for. And, and uh, as I say, it's very interesting to see what it's evolved into. I'd be quite interested in taking that and dropping it on one of my servers and, and seeing how well uh, it goes because it could well be a viable alternative to having a Google Apps account for a small organization. Um, and be very interested to see how that works out. Especially if you're using, if you have a lot of people in the organization that are just sort of barely computer users. Because one of the things I did like about the interfaces that I was seeing was it's all very obvious, very explicit. This is the menu. These are the three things you can do. You know, it's that I, I, I think there are, there's always going to be a call for very simplified interfaces to things uh, and with maybe some complex stuff behind the scenes that you could escape back to. But, but to be able to do simple commands and simple operations, so... I'm pretty happy with that. So, all righty. Well, you know, uh, I don't have an awkward transition, but I, we do have some upcoming guests. <laughs> that's, I guess that's about as awkward as it gets. I, I don't have one again. Okay, so we have a bunch of people on the, uh, the short list that have already been booked. Um, next week, in fact, we're going to be talking to some people from Spree Commerce, which is a uh, e-commerce solution, a full-on uh, solution with uh, the open core model. Too bad you're not coming. You might no, you're not coming back next week, Simon, but uh, that's always one of your favorite hot topics. Uh, that, after that, open shift which is Red Hat's new free cloud hosting. How can they do free? I don't understand. We'll have to ask them how they can get away with doing it for free. Uh, finally, somebody from Gen 2 has jumped forward and said, you know, I can't believe we've gone through 200 shows without talking about Gen 2. So the Gen 2 guys are going to come on and talk about their whole philosophy of building Linux from scratch all the time. Uh, Apache Software Foundation guy is going to come on. I don't have the names in front of me, sorry. Livevert, which is a virtual virtualization system, allows you to control all the virtualization systems like um, Xen and VMware and, and uh, Open vir- VirtualBox, uh, all uh, using the same APIs. Uh, LibreOffice coming back. And uh, Simon, I think you're uh, taking the uh, helm on that one because uh, you yep, helped me going to. bring that to you. Very good, very good. And uh, finally on this list, Excito, which is a home media server. Uh, they actually sell the hardware, but they provide the software for you if you want to just run it on your own hardware. It looks like a pretty nice little product there. A bunch of other people on the short list, twit.tv slash floss is where you can find all the ones that we're already talking to or maybe some that we aren't talking to yet. Now, if there's some people way down at the bottom of that list that you want to have them move up, please email them and tell them to email me. They'll move them up on the list. Um, uh, you can also follow us, Floss Weekly, on Google+. Uh, just search for Floss Weekly. We have a page there. Uh, we also have a Twitter and Identica handles uh, uh, that is Floss Weekly, all one word. We try to get the word out as I book new guests or as we're about to tape a show. Speaking of that, we do have a live chat room while we're taping the show on Wednesdays. Uh, 9.30 a.m. U.S. Pacific time. So right now it's uh, that's GMT minus 7. In the winter, it's GMT minus 8. And I sure wish we'd get rid of daylight savings time. It would sure simplify a lot of things for all of us. You can follow me at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N, on Twitter. Uh, but I'm more active on my Google Plus page. So just look for Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus. You almost certainly find me. I'll be one of the first search hits there. Uh, if you follow that, you'll find out that I'm going to be in New York City on uh, May 24th to 26th. Probably have at least some meetup of some kind. Maybe just start hanging out at a, at a club somewhere. Uh, the Pearl Mongers, I think, are going to like uh, hook up on one of the nights and go to Peculiar because we do that for all old time's sake. That used to be where I used to go all the time when I was there. I'll be in Hamilton, Bermuda, uh, parked on a big cruise ship from May 29th to June 1st. So if any of you are in Hamilton, please, uh, let's do a meetup there because that would be kind of fun. I'm going to be there basically parked for four days uh, working for Captain Neil while sitting on a cruise ship. Pretty nice that way. And I'm also going to be in Madison, Wisconsin, June 12th through 15th for yet another Pearl Conference in North America. Uh, I'm teaching a Git class there. I'm going to hang out and uh, hang out with other Pearl people for a while. And it should be kind of fun. So if you're in that area, let me know. I'm also in July, I'm going to be at OSCON and Fizzley. Both of them just got invited to uh, speak at Fizzley again. So that's going to be a lot of fun. Now, all the way down to Puerto Rico, Brazil. More about that as it gets closer, but that's probably enough plugging for today. Simon, what do you want to plug today? 
Uh, I'm now writing regularly for InfoWorld, and I would love mm. every single viewer and listener to go uh, make it look as if you all love me, because that will make them keep me for longer. Um, if you would like to meet up, uh, if you go visit my website, that's webmink.com, uh, you'll find pointers to all the places where I'm writing and speaking. Uh, upcoming engagements, I'm going to be in Chicago uh, for the OSI board meeting in mid-May. Uh, if you're in Chicago and you would like to uh, go out for coffee or something harder, drop me a line. I'm also going to be in Amsterdam for the Open Storage Summit on May 24th. And uh, like Randall, I've also got a talk accepted at OSCON, so I'll be in Portland in the middle of the year. But if you check out webmink.com, webmink on Identica, webmink on Twitter, uh, the only place I'm not webmink is on Google+. Plus. There's quite a bit going on there too. Uh, do say hi if you heard me speak on Floss Weekly because uh, it's always great to hear from Floss Weekly listeners. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And uh, speaking of Floss Weekly listeners, I'm sure our audience is very appreciative that you're back on the show again. I, I am also personally appreciative that you can come on the show from time to time in your busy schedule and say hello and uh, give me the insights to complement and supplement what I'm able to come up with. Absolutely. Well, it's, uh, there's some interesting stuff going on in the open source world at the moment. What with the reforms that we're doing at OSI, uh, what with the uh, the lawsuit that uh, but by the time people hear this at the weekend, maybe they will have heard the verdict from the Oracle Google lawsuit. But mm. we're sitting here on Wednesday and uh, the jury hasn't come back in yet. So there's lots of interesting stuff going on and I'm looking forward to uh, maybe talking about that some more in some future shows, Randall. Absolutely. Sounds a great. Maybe we just set aside one show to kind of catch up on all the current uh, open source news. Yep, that will be a good move, I think, yes. Very good, very good. Well, once again, thank you, Simon, for being my co-host today, and thank you all for listening and watching whatever way you get this show, and we'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly. Floss Weekly.